Hello, webinar attendees. My name is Marisol Morales, and I serve as the Vice President for Network Leadership with Campus Compact. We hope that you, your families, and communities are staying healthy and taking care of each other. We want to begin first with a land acknowledgement statement. Um, as a step towards honoring the truth and achieving healing and reconciliation, Campus Compact seeks to acknowledge the traditional native lands on which we stand. Given that we are gathering for today's webinar from across the country and some from around the world, we invite you to acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the native people where you are joining us from now in the chat. So feel free to put that in the chat. I'm participating from Chicago, which is located on the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations. Many other tribes, such as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menowee, Sac, and Fox also called this area home. This region has long been a center for indigenous people to gather, trade, and maintain kinship ties. Today, one of the largest urban American Indian communities in the United States resides in Chicago. Members of this community continue to contribute to the life of this city and to celebrate their heritage, practice traditions, and care for the land and waterways. We also want to acknowledge and stand in solidarity with those individuals who are continuing to call for racial justice in equitable communities and affirm that Black Lives Matter. We commit to move beyond words into programs and actions that fully embody a commitment to full participation and equity. We're so happy to have you as part of our webinar today titled Risk Management and Community Engagement, Considerations and Recommendations in the Time of COVID-19 with our wonderful and talented presenters who I'll be introducing shortly. Thank you for those sharing the indigenous lands that you are residing on. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, first, we will uh, be hosting the Fusion course, Enhancing Online Education Through Community-Based Learning. It's a course offered over the summer that seeks to provide critical training and support to faculty as they adapt to online teaching in this time of COVID. The course will be $250 for members and $600 for non-members. We have a special running um, from today through July 11th for $50 off the course. Um, it's just with the um, code 50 spelled out off. Um, registration is open for sessions two and three. Um, session one is full and you can find out more information by visiting our Campus Compact website at events.compact.org backslash fusion. Again, that's events.compact.org backslash fusion. Also, our Impact Award nominations are open, so you can nominate a faculty, community engagement professionals, or two and four year institutions for any of our five awards. Um, you can find out more information about our Impact Awards at compact.org. Um, now let me introduce our panelists. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Michelle Dehart. Michelle is the Director of Risk Management and Regulatory Compliance with Syracuse University and Board Secretary for Orange Insurance Company, LLC. She is responsible for assisting leadership in implementing an overall approach to risk financing based on the results of risk assessment, research, and analysis of business processes around the organization. Prior to joining Syracuse University in 2003, she was empo employed by Progressive Insurance, where she worked in personal uh, lines claims. Michelle holds a BA in Liberal Arts from Syracuse University. Next, I'd like to introduce Pamela Kerwin Heinz. Pamela is the founding director of the Mary uh, Ann Shaw Center for Public and Community Service, the Shaw Center, and associate vice president for engagement at Syracuse University. As part of academic affairs, the Shaw Center collaborates with multiple campus, community, and higher education stakeholders to develop and sustain complex reciprocal partnerships that meet the learning outcomes and research goals of the academy and the needs of the community. Under Pamela's direction, Syracuse University was nationally designated with Carnegie Community Engagement Classification and Curricular and Outreach uh, Partnerships in 2006. Syracuse University has been recognized on the President's Higher Education Honor Roll with the Distinction for Community Service and received one of three Presidential Higher Education Community Service Honor Roll Special Focus Area Awards. She is a founding member of the New York Campus Compact, uh, the state affiliate for higher education's National Coalition, our campus compact. 
Pamela has experience as an elected and appointed public official. She received her master's in public administration from the Maxwell School for Citizenship and Public Policy at Syracuse University. Next, we have my former colleague and friend, Alex Soto. Alex is the Director of Risk Management at the University of Laverne in Southern California. He's responsible for the mission of the Risk Management Department, which is to reduce exposures to fortuitous losses to the greatest extent possible and reduce the unanticipated financial impact of those losses at the university, its employees, students, and visitors. The Office of Risk Management is a resource to the university in the areas of general risk management, risk identification and control, loss prevention and control, claims management, and risk transfer through purchasing insurance and contractual agreements. He is also a part-time professional ski patroller involved in mountain rescue and is certified in risk management in the snow sports industry. Alex holds a BA in economics and business from Westmont College and an MBA from Azusa Pacific University. And finally, Amy Thomas. Amy Thomas is the Director of Environmental Health, Safety, and Risk Management at California State University, Monterey Bay, and has a Master's in Public Administration. She has over 25 years of experience with safety in higher education, including risk and insurance management, occupational safety, environmental health, business continuity, emergency management, and crime prevention. So I wanna thank and welcome our panelists um, as we begin today, as the attendees will see, uh, we have great knowledge amongst our panelists and we're really looking forward to this conversation. So let's get started. Hello everyone and good day. This is Amy Thomas, I'll be starting us off. And uh, I, I say good day because I know we come from a bunch of time zones. Um, we're even at, it's, there's people from other countries, so I can't imagine what time it is or day. <laughs> you might be ahead of us. Uh, so we're excited to participate with you today. And um, you have opportunities to chat questions, and we, um, as the panelists, will do our best to monitor those. And then as well at the end, we'll have time to chat. And then uh, all of us will go into breakout rooms. We'll have uh, a lot of time, uh, 20 minutes or so, to really participate together and discuss what we're going to go over with you right now. So I'm going to advance here. Okay. All right. These, this is just a breakdown of how we chose to put this presentation together for you today. So I will go over Risk Management 101 and remind you what uh, risk management tools are. Uh, and then Pam's going to bring us building relationships, which we all believe is a huge foundation to working um, with your risk manager. And then thirdly, we're going to go through community engagement in a pandemic. And uh, that's what Michelle's going to bring to us and talk more specifically about COVID-19 and what has changed and how we pivoted. And then Alex brings us um, closure at the end in thinking through what has changed or how do we address community partnerships in light of COVID. So here we go. We want to talk to you about risk management and the foundations and really how it is meant to help you and uh, to enhance your programs and never be a hindrance. So to start with, some things that we want everyone to remember. Uh, I don't come into this assuming that you know nothing about risk management because as you'll see in a future slide, I really do believe that we are all risk managers. And so these are just going to be reminders hopefully for you that risk management is intended as a way to uh, approach risk and assess it, look at it, manage it, not eliminate risk. We don't claim to be able to stop all hazards from happening to people. And in fact, those are not guarantees you should be able to make. So we all acknowledge that in our programs, there is some element of risk um, and potential hazard, but we wanna use a lot of good care. Uh, and in fact, we have a duty to care for the students that we place, uh, we have a duty to care for the communities and engagement opportunities that we are participating in. We, we don't want to harm the place we go into. We don't want to harm the participants of those places. And certainly as universities and institutes of higher education, we have obvious liabilities um, with how we uh, function and put students into situations. So there are a number of tools that uh, you should be aware of and your risk manager on your campus should be aware of. You always help reduce. Uh, whether it's liabilities that you're reducing or to increase the safety of the program. And uh, some of that has to do with things like your safety plan that you develop, maybe at your site. We recognize um, the higher education institutions participating today include community colleges. 
and obviously uh, public institutions, private institutions, and then again, our partners across the world who may have different structures for their uh, institutes of higher education. But all of us have some form, hopefully a written plan or a written agreement or documents that our students um, are informed and then they consent to participate. And that's one method of increasing their safety is making them aware of what they're getting into. So that's a risk reduction tool and it helps to reduce our liabilities for the institution. Uh, informed consent can come in the form of a lot of different names. We, we don't wanna bombard you with jargon or with too much uh, risk management acronyms, uh, but there are a lot of different terminologies that you may encounter. And um, for those of us who've been in the, in the business of risk management a long time, we try our hardest to uh, uh, reduce the incomprehensible jargon and keep it on a, a level playing field. So you may hear terms like release of liability or a waiver or hold harmless. Uh, all of those are, are almost the same thing. It's usually a document that the participant will read, hopefully understand, ask questions if they don't, and then they sign it. And it becomes a legal document stating that they were made aware that even the worst harm could come to them if they so choose to participate in that activity or that placement or that community engagement. So as adults, we're expecting them to uh, understand what they're getting into. And yes, these documents can sometimes be scary because they, they give all the way to death that somebody could, you know, that could happen to them. And we realize that's extreme and it's not meant to, to cause fear to anyone, but it's the reality that we don't know what, what could happen in any given situation. So as an institution, we're required to, to state some of that legal um, liability limits and that the limit would be that, that we could be sued for anything perhaps, but that we may not be held responsible or found to have to pay for something. And that's where identification comes in. That's a fancy term and oftentimes it's just nobody really understands what it means, but the way I like to break it down is who's gonna pay for damages? Who's gonna pay for the harm when it happens? It's usually a paragraph or a promise statement that says this party will pay or maybe uh, the other party, you hope that the other party is going to be held responsible to pay for damages. Or maybe you make it mutual, where both parties say, we'll pay for things we're negligent or we, we cause or are known to cause or suspected to cause, and you pay for the things that you're suspected to cause. So damnification is an important part of a contract, and it's a risk management tool to, to outline who's going to be responsible to pay. Then once you've said who would be responsible to pay, you have to usually have an insurance program behind that, because nobody really has the, um, you know, the money pot out there, all of our institutions of it, higher education uh, have moments where we're strapped uh, for, for cash and we don't wanna waste money as well. So programs are a good tool for any institute of higher education to uh, have a way to pay for those to come forward. And so if you think of indemnification as, you know, promising who's going to be responsible to pay and then insurance is the method by which you would pay if something comes up. Um, a claim or a, a, a some form of liability, a lawsuit, a damage, um, harm to a person that someone brings forward. Uh, and then something I love to mention when we're working with um, uh, principal investigators is how we call them in the US, uh, people who are our researchers or faculty who are setting forth and, and dreaming up these really great community engagements. Uh, we have to remind them of their personal liability as well. And that's what your risk manager can do well to, to inform people about is that we're not just out to protect the university's bottom line. We really do want to, number one, uh, increase safety and reduce harm to people. And then we also want our individuals to understand that the university can only go so far to protect someone uh, is if they're working outside of the scope of their uh, job or their responsibility and they, uh, as, as any risk manager might feel, that they go rogue, uh, they, they go out and do something they ought not to do or they're negligent in their responsibilities, they may incur personal individual liability that the university might have to back away from them and say, yes, you did this wrong thing and we can't really protect you from that and we don't have insurance to protect you from that. So again, risk management is something that can be very personal because you need to be doing the right thing in a study of care. And of course, risk management uh, informs all of the legal authorities that are out there, regulations, boundaries that we must follow, uh, again, to increase safety and reduce liability.
And then who are these people? <laughs> who are we risk managers? Uh, and in, again, because we have such a wide and varied audience of institutes of higher education today and, and in the compact program um, or group, we realize that your structures are going to vary in your campuses and in your institutes. Uh, so you may have a risk manager that is assigned uh, to help you with anything. Maybe they're even embedded in your department, perhaps, and you have someone that, that carries the risk management title. And then it could go all the way in a spectrum to where it's only a tiny percentage of a person's job description. For example, I work in one of the largest uh, university systems, they're called the California State University System, and uh, we have 23 campuses. I work at one of the 23 campuses, and at my campus, we have a, a student full-time enrollment of almost 8,000 students, and so that, we, we consider that a small to mid-sized um, mid campus, and for us, I, I have several hats that I wear. Um, if, you, if you listen to my title, I have environmental health and safety, I have risk management, and I, uh, what's not called out in my title, I also have business continuity. So uh, your risk manager may be balancing not just risk management, and risk management includes all those things I mentioned on the previous slide. And so it can be a busy job, and so your risk manager may be stretched thin. Or they may have all the time in the world to attend to your needs and to your program needs. So sometimes they'll give extra attention or limited attention. And you really need to understand how that structure is on your campus. Uh, maybe they report to a regional or a headquarters, again, in the California State University system. We have 23 campuses and a headquarters, which we call our chancellor's office. So our chancellor's office actually does have a system-wide risk manager. So that's something you're going to want to understand is, is how do campus risk managers fold up and report perhaps up to a main office? And are they getting executive orders or other directions that your campus should follow or guidelines from a higher authority beyond your campus or your president? Maybe your campus calls your, your lead CEO a uh, counselor or whatever title your local authority has than what other regional authorities are you under. So where your risk manager is in the organization definitely says something about what we call, uh, as jargon, the risk appetite of the institution. So if your risk manager is on a spectrum of way down low on the totem pole, nobody knows who this person is, they're in some dark office, people avoid them, they fit more the black cloud. <laughs> situation that people don't like to talk to that person, they're scary, uh, that's one way. And then you could have them all the way elevated where they may report up to your highest levels, your president, your cabinet, your chancellor, and they have a prominent seat at the table. Uh, so it can very greatly take my video off real quick. I hate to interrupt, but I just make sure that my um, internet is stable. So if I take my video off, you could hear me better. All right, a real goal of risk management in community engagement and in anything risk managers do should be getting to yes. We want to help enhance your programs. We don't want to hinder them as my first slide said. So we wanna make sure that these are the tools that are being used. We assess the risk. We try to help you identify what could go wrong. Uh, is there going to be harm to people, property? What has gone wrong in the past is an important question, and, and your risk manager will probably wonder about this or ask about it, so it's good for you to identify. At these sites where you're placing students, has there, have there been any problems in the past? How have those been corrected? Uh, what else can we avoid happening again that went wrong? Uh, we want to reduce the risk at all times. And again, not just from a liability financial standpoint, but we want to increase safety. So what rules are out there that we should be following? These will help us get to yes much quicker uh, if we understand what is happening at the site where you're placing a student. And we rely upon you to, to gauge that for us and to help us really get a picture. Is it, are they being placed in uh, to help partner or counsel or put in a setting like in a prison where they're gonna work in a part of that? Or are they working in a program with children? Or are they working with animals? Are they working in public settings? Uh, we have created sometimes to reduce the risk. And sometimes we can't 
as, as I said from the beginning, we never really can eliminate risk. So we want to be creative in how to inform students about what they're being faced with. What rules do they need to follow? Uh, informed consent, I've already gone over with you. That's a way of informing our students uh, and the participants of what they may encounter. We can't dream up everything, but it helps us if we can give them some good guidelines on what they may encounter. Uh, insurance, again, is an important tool, and that's where um, insurance is the, the finances that fund who promised that they would be responsible to pay or a party to pay. And there could be other controls based on all of this information that we would get from you when we do a risk assessment. This um, graphic on the screen is not meant for you to read. It's really just to show you how complicated getting to yes could be. And for that reason, sometimes you uh, might feel like your risk manager is a person who um, says no or has the power to say no. And I would venture to say that in most cases, risk managers don't actually have that much power at your institute of higher, higher education. But there's usually executives above us that make those true approval authoritative decisions. And what we do is help people, it's a great term to say getting to yes, because we're gonna lay out a lot of options to help you get to yes, if you so choose. Because sometimes, like my last question on this slide is, do you still want to do it? <laughs> because sometimes the hoops can be onerous. The steps, the paperwork, the amount of cost for extra insurance, those could be things that could possibly help the planner or the um, person placing students in different sites to determine that, wow, this is, this is really not a good option for us, and we choose to say no to this. So it may not be a risk manager saying no, but they could gently guide you to some um, good decision making. So lastly, I just wanna say, as I started in the beginning, saying that um, there's a term in risk management called ERM, Enterprise Risk Management. And so that's an approach where uh, campus-wide, Everybody, everybody has woven risk and safety into their thought processes. Hopefully you have tools like handbooks and guides that lay out for community engagement, how risk should be managed, and it helps you to integrate or embed that whole process into your planning phases, your risk assessing procedures that get developed into your engagement plans. And the point is, I like to say that ERM really should stand for everyone's a risk manager. So everyone, risk manager. And with that, we all understand that this is something that we're all engaged in, not just a person with the title of risk management, because as adults, we do this all the time. It is just what we do as adults. We, we walk through life managing risk, and we just may not have called it that. Uh, and then a really key component of uh, everyone being a risk manager is to have positive relationships with one another. And you have to work at that. And so Pam's going to lead us into how we do foster those positive relationships centered around caring about what we all are involved in together. So Pam. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Amy. Um, are you going to pull up the slides? Uh, one of the things that I want to share with everyone is after listening to all the explanation that Amy made about working with risk managers, obviously you really need to have a partnership with the risk management office. Um, in order to move your agenda from a risk averse stance to how are we going to do this or how are we going to determine to say yes, it is really important for you to consult with the risk manager. And one of the most important overriding aspects of the partnership is making sure that the ethical community engagement practice does require robust risk management. So it is really important in order to address the issues of equity and um, relationship and power, the differential, differential, differential between the campus and the community. I think most of you are aware, and particularly in the time of the pandemic, I think we've all realized how um, extreme the inequities are, and particularly with regards to uh, technology and availability of resources. So it's really, really important for you to develop the relationship with risk management. I will say unequivocally that the reason I believe we've been so successful at Syracuse is that the risk manager was one of the first people that I got to know when I started working. This was a whole new field. So there was very little understanding at that time about the actual structure of our risk management 
agendas and programs that we'd all be developing. And I was very fortunate to have um, an excellent young man who worked very closely with our attorney who helped us put together the key components of our plan and also shared it with the local um, folks of the community as well as other colleagues in uh, higher education. And it turned out to be a really interesting experience for me. And I still find risk management to be one of the people I go to first with just about any question that will come up. So it is, it's really important to um, follow a plan of introducing yourself and your office to your risk manager if you haven't already met your colleague. Uh, and before you do that, it's a really a good, really important to do some background work, to do some just some Google research, take some of the information you're gaining today and pursue it a little bit further. Check out any particular important aspects of the community that you're in, the county, the state, the country, the region. There are all different aspects of um, laws and rules that impact the kind of work that we do. So take some time to do your own research so that you have a little bit of, an, of a concept and a context before you talk to your risk manager. And also be sure that you're, you have a pretty good idea of at least a starting point of where you want, how you want to set up your programs and what you think will work so that you can introduce yourself in a very positive way to your risk manager. Um, one of the other things I'll say in, in my experience in meeting so many folks in this field over my time doing this work, majority of them I find are very involved with their communities. They are engaged in multiple ways. And so community engagement is near and dear to the hearts of many of the risk managers that I've worked with. So they will frequently find this a very um, exciting way for them to be engaged in a part of the campus they might not otherwise be engaged with. Because in our case, and I think the case of many of you here today, you may have students that are working in your office helping to run the programs, and our risk managers have enjoyed very much getting to know our interns who run our programs. And I might say we have now convinced not just the management school, but the I school to really include risk management in their curriculum. And I have students contacting me every year to do projects about risk management related to doing engagement. So it can open up a whole other area of consideration um, in doing this kind of work, whether you're doing it on campus or you're doing it in the community or doing it as part of a kind of a job. Set up a time to meet, share what you know, emphasize the importance of working as a team because you can't do this work on your own. It's part of your job as a strategic leader to bring in other people on your campus. And as a community engagement professional, you need to be introducing individuals to each other across campus in embedding this work throughout the campus as well as in the community. So this provides an excellent opportunity. Risk managers typically know everyone on campus or they know every area on campus. They're very involved in the business side of the house. Uh, and so they can be tremendous assets for you going forward in other areas where you may have questions. And then listen and learn. And you will find that this will be one of the most rewarding relationships, I promise you. Now, if you have a, sort of a little more difficult risk manager, I suspect most of you are pretty good at managing relationships, but take some time to find out about the individual ask questions, be sure you respond to inquiries when you get them. A really good way to get to know your colleagues is sometimes include them in other meetings you might be having. We included our risk manager at the very beginning in our community partners meeting we did once a year. Frequently I would take uh, one or two of them with me to meetings in the community. And I also helped them when we were setting up Campus Compact in New York, we did presentations around the state. So they became very embedded and had a really good um, feel for being respected and being needed in this particular uh, part of our work. And it worked out really well. I sought advice and I still seek advice. Um, we've developed such a really sound program right now that uh, I realized I hadn't talked to Michelle enough lately. So through this particular uh, webinar, we're going to get together more often now and reconnect particularly in this, uh, this particular 
time of COVID because we are facing a whole new platform of things that we're going to need to be um, addressing. And the most important thing is to stay in touch with your risk management folks wherever you are. And I promise you, if you do that, you will have a very successful program. Okay, so now we're going to move on to uh, Michelle, I believe, who's going to talk more specifically about risk management in a time of COVID. Thank you, Pam, for that. Um, I, I echo that the relationship between Pam and my office is what makes both of our programs successful. And to know that I can count that she's going to do what I see as the right thing in risk management. So I echo that and thank you, Pam. Um, for the next couple of minutes, I want to talk to you about what stays the same in managing risk for community engagement during COVID-19 and also what's going to change. So I want to start with what's going to stay the same. Amy talked to you about risk management 101 and all of that is still going to be part of your process. So you're not going to be reinventing the wheel. You're just going to be building on all the sound processes that you already have. You're still going to need to identify, assess, and manager, manage and monitor risks. You may use different terms on your campus um, on how you address risks, but the point I really want to stress is to make sure you're working with your risk management to do things like identify the risks with the placement. Talk to them about how to plan to manage the risks and what you may need their guidance and assistance with. The most beneficial thing, because you are the experts, is to come to your risk management office or professional and talk to them about the plans you've already made to mitigate your risks. You're going to continue to monitor the risks and how they might be changing as a response to the pandemic changes. You're also going to be looking at risks as something that's never a one and done situation. Understanding the risks in your placement is an ongoing process that needs your attention. Universities are still expected to act with reasonable care to prevent foreseeable harm to our students. And the expectation now is that you're gonna to continue to act with that reasonable care because that's how you will keep your students as safe as possible as we and avoid issues and still provide them with engagements that are important to their education. You need to make sure you're telling your students of the risks in any placements and, and from a risk manager side, document those conversations. Make sure you're giving them the information, but it's equally important to document that you did that. I think site visits are a very important part of what you do with your community partners. And it's gonna stay an important part of your risk assessment. You may be doing them virtually, but they're still gonna be in that important piece. Maybe you may have to get creative as we move through COVID and evaluating a new site, but I, I encourage you don't stop that process. It's not a step that you should be skipping just because you can't physically get there. Your pre-program orientation and the ones provided by your community partner are very important under normal circumstances. And as we move forward in the new normal, they're gonna to continue to be. You might need to add material that will help students understand any new expectations that relate to COVID-19, but the, that orientation is still gonna be a very important part of your process and placement. So as we talk about what will change, so you're gonna continue with your pre-pandemic procedures. None of that's gonna change and then you should still complete your risk assessments. But what's going to change and how is it gonna look different? So the types of engagements that are gonna be available. You should be talking to your community partners, if you're not already, about their capacity and their needs during the pandemic. This is gonna be an important step in mitigating risk for your students. You don't want to send a student to a partner that doesn't have the capacity to supervise the placement or just because they're so stressed under the pandemic, they really can't take your students. When we look at what placements are going to look like, they're going to be virtual and they're going to be in person, we hope. So I want to talk about in person first. If you plan to send students out into the community, you need to engage your risk manager early and often. I cannot stress that enough. They have a lot on their plates, just like you do now with the pandemic. And if you're thinking about in-person placements in the fall semester, if they're possible, start that conversation now, even if you don't have all of the answers. Things I think you're gonna need to consider is what is the health and safety plan of your community partner? Do they have one? Is it adequate? What is your campus appetite for having students out in the community when they're trying to control the infection on campus? This is a conversation that if your risk manager doesn't have the answer, they can help you get that answer. Because 
if your campus is trying to control the spread, they may tell you now that you can't place students in the fall out into the community, and that's something you need to know as part of your assessment. Do you need to alter your written agreement with a community partner? Some of you on the here may or may not have written agreements. If you do, it's time to think about do they need to be altered? And I think Alice is going to touch on that in a little bit for you. So do you need to add COVID-19 language to re releases of liability? Don't expect you to know that answer. Again, reach out to your risk manager. They will help you with that. What will the training and supply provisions for PPE be about disinfectants and cleaning methods? Are you going to be leaving that up to your community partners? And are they prepared for that? These are all conversations and things you need to be thinking about now. I think more likely that you're going to be moving into the virtual world come fall. And risk management is there to help community engagement opportunities to be safe, robust, and satisfying for all parties involved. This doesn't change in the virtual world. Logistics for planning and determining what your community partners need and want will change, but not how you think about risk, I hope. Things you want to think about is do your community partners have the ability to go to virtual or have projects that students can do without being on site? You need to talk to your risk manager when you find out what those are and see what thoughts and concerns they have. Again, reach out early. They may think of things that you didn't and you may bring things to them that they weren't aware of. When you talk about virtual platforms, what platform will your students be working on? We think ideally you should be working on the community partners what, um, platform and what they're using. What are their security precautions you need to take to make the students aware of on those platforms? We know all of our students have grown up in the digital world, but their focus is not security and that's an aspect that you can bring to them to help them better engage with the community. You probably already talked to your students about the use of social media and the necessary precautions. But this is a good time to reiterate it if we're moving into a virtual interactions so that they know your expectations and are having the forefront of their minds. One of the things that's important to community engagement for our students is tracking of their hours, especially when it counts towards their degrees. From a risk manager's perspective, I think you need to have a plan on what does that look like and how are you going to document it? Who's going to be responsible for knowing when they logged in? For supervision of community placements, talk to your community partners about their expectations and their ability to supervise students providing services remotely. Some of them are going to fall back on you and if so, what does that look like and are you prepared? How are you going to audit the supervision? So this brings me to what I want to talk about work, working with youth in a virtual setting. While students are working with minors during a community engagement or under the supervision of that community partner, I strongly believe, and I think many of your risk managers out there will as well, the protection of minors is everyone's responsibility. If your community engagement involves minors in a virtual setting, I strongly encourage you to work with your risk manager on best practices. It's something that we've worked with Pam closely on and some of her engagements that have moved to the virtual world. And I think it sets up everyone for success if you do it early. And this is where that partnership is going to help you. And if you haven't opened that door to your risk manager before, this is a perfect opportunity to do it. And many of you may have on your campus youth protection officers that go under many titles across the country and world, but reach out to them as well. They will have resources for you here to make it easy, an easier transition. Some things that I think are important for you to remind your students about. They should never have one-on-one -on -one interaction with someone under the age of 18 in a virtual setting through social media. This may seem hard when you're talking about a mentor-mentee relationship, which I know many of our programs have, but it's for the protection of both your student and that minor involved. If you run into, and we did, where you find a situation that one-on-one -on -one is going to occur because that's the important part of that relationship, is put it on a platform that's interruptible. What I mean by that is put it out on Zoom, give that link to a supervisor, and the expectation is that that supervisor is popping in once during that interaction every time. Making a safe interaction, we think when you work in the virtual world and what we promote here at Syracuse, is it needs to include someone else on that interaction. So whether that be a text message where you include another adult or video chat where the other person is there but not participating. If your community partner is not providing youth protection training, I think it's something you should look to provide for your 
student. It helps educate them on the expectations of working in a virtual world with minors. Remind them not to take contact outside of that program with anyone under the age of 18. I know they might want to connect on many of the social platforms, but it's not, it's strongly, strongly discouraged. I think as we move forward, community engagement will be different in the fall, and it's likely going to be into the spring with COVID-19. But using and adopting your sound risk management techniques and partnering with your risk manager will help you mitigate the risk and protect your students. We're here to make your program successful because the success of our students is why we're all here. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex. Okay, great. Excellent information, Michelle, Pam, Amy. These are all excellent takeaways for our audience today. Uh, couldn't have said it any better. If you've noticed, there, there has been some slight crossover between um, our panelists this, this afternoon, evening, morning, whatever, whatever time zone you're in. And you're going to hear a little bit more crossover as well from me because our goal here is to continue to emphasize the fundamentals and the foundation and the principles of risk management that we are trying to convey over to you and the additional okay. COVID-19 matters that we also have to be aware of. So let's uh, go ahead and continue on and, fin and wrap up the discussion before I turn it back over to Marisol. Uh, my section, we're gonna be discussing areas that you need to be discussing with your partners and by now you you already probably know this but everything we're talking about here is relational you know this area of discussing with your partners your expectations your goals uh, our purposes it's all relational which is not necessarily always how we handle some of the other risk management functions and duties, you know, we're just contracting to purchase a thousand widgets. Most of that can just be done in the form of an agreement. But here we're working with students, with people. And the relational aspect that Pam had mentioned earlier is so critical. And I was very fortunate to develop a very good relationship with Marisol when she was still working here with the, at the University of Laverne and now the uh, civic and community engagement department it's the same thing and, and i gotta be honest with you they challenge me probably the most out of any other department that i deal with and it's a it's a good it's a good way it's a good thing and, and it's done in a good way but you have a lot of moving parts when you're dealing with students when you're dealing with community partners and it takes a lot of precision to ensure the safety of our students and the safety of the institution that you're working for. So um, let's move on. Uh, one of the things that we talked about earlier, I think Amy mentioned it, and was um, actually if we can back up, Amy, I think we want, there we go. So the partnership agreement. I'd like to establish our relationships based on a good fundamental partnership agreement. Those agreements, they can be called a lot of different things. Sometimes it can get confusing. Sometimes you'll hear people say a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, or a contract, or an agreement, or an affiliation agreement. They're known as different, there's different terms, but they're all the same thing. They're all contracts, and they all require two parties to enter into a relationship. A contract for us at the University of Laverne is the foundation. And that's just something that you'll need to think about to determine if this is something that your culture should be working under or not. I can't tell you if it's the right thing or, or the wrong thing to do. However, it, it is a basic fundamental risk management principle that you should highly consider. In that contract, you wanna be able to state the objectives of the relationship. What, what, what are you interested in accomplishing in entering into a relationship with a community partner? Well, we both have our goals and objectives. We want to be able to um, both create that win-win situation. So make sure that that's discussed and it's clearly identified in the agreement. Uh, you also want to make sure, believe it or not, that the two agreeing parties are clearly identified. I have seen contracts that have been circulated to the Office of Risk Management 
where this was very vague. It was very unclear who was entering into this agreement because a third party was brought into play. So we want to know who the players are, and it needs to be articulated very clearly within the agreements and the contracts. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, what, what's the purpose? Make sure that the contracts clearly state the purpose of the relationship so that from the get-go, we all know what that roadmap is telling us. And then finally, solid terms and conditions. Uh, next slide, Amy. Um, back up one more. There we go. So terms and conditions, this is where it gets into the nuts and bolts of the agreement itself. How long is this agreement going to be? Is it a one-year uh, relationship? Is it three? Is it five? Best practice in risk management, mm, maybe three to five years at most. You don't really want to go beyond that. And uh, each institution is going to have their own policy. For example, at the University of Laverne, we don't like to go any more than three years unless general counsel has reviewed the document as well. So that's just something to consider. Uh, responsibilities of the community partner, very, very important. Make sure that the agreement clearly articulates what the responsibility is of the community partner and what the responsibility is of the university. So say, for example, the student is injured while he is under the, he or she are under the care, custody, and control of that community partner. Are we expecting them to provide first aid measures for a student? Well, yes, we should be. And we want to make sure that that's articulated within the document itself. Uh, other terms and conditions? Next slide, Amy. Okay, so this section here is, is very important. And this was also discussed earlier. Amy mentioned some of this, and I think Michelle may have also mentioned a little bit. Two sections that are very important in a contract is the indemnification clause or the indemnification paragraph agreement and the insurance component. So as Amy mentioned earlier, indemnification is, she said, who's going to pay? So in this cartoon, uh, I'm saying indemnification is, well, who are we going to blame today? And it, it's, you know, we're jokingly discussing this section right here, but is, it is a very important part of any agreement, regardless of whether it's part of, of an affiliation agreement with our students or any type of contract if I'm purchasing widgets. You're almost always gonna see an indemnification clause in the contract itself. Uh, limitation of liability, I think, is another one that you'll also see. However, you wanna make sure that you have a clause in there. And I would recommend passing it by your general counsel. Let them take a look at this section as well. Uh, the insurance. Insurance, to me, it's, it's the foundation. It's the financial responsibility that if something goes wrong, there's gonna be some financial responsibility on both sides. Now we as, as um, higher educational institutions, we know we carry the coverage. We have to, to run our operations and our business. However, when it comes to the insurance with a partner, you may or may not be able to find some partners that always will have insurance to offer or they may have the insurance, but it may be underinsured. And in risk management, we have certain commercial level limits that we operate under. Typically it's 1 million, 2 million. And in some cases that number is now increasing to 2 million and 4 million. That's pretty steep when you think about it for a small community partner. Are they gonna be able to afford that? So all we're saying here is take a look at the insurance, work with your risk manager to make sure that they have the, the partner is adequately insured and if they're not you're going to be in a position where you're going to have to make a business decision as we mentioned earlier in one of the slides do we still want to do it well that's these two areas are very important to ask yourself that question if you find that the community partner cannot meet minimum um, insurance limits and the section with the insurance is also critical 
is the sexual abuse and molestation. So that's another area that I would highly recommend you ask your community partners, do they offer that? Do they have that coverage? Because when we send our students off to these environments, and as, as Michelle had mentioned earlier, you don't want to have your students in uh, meeting with their supervisors from the community partner without any other representation. And this is where it can get dicey. So if those things by chance do happen, we, and something does unfortunately happen, we want to know that there is insurance that the community partner can present to address the abuse and molestation. Uh, next slide, Amy. Okay. Um, what about the student? Let's let's bring them into the into play here. Let's let's also remember them. They're going to be the ones that are out there in the field. Let's talk about their goals. What are our goals? What are their goals for student learning? Um, are they on board with this? Are they comfortable going into these type of environments? And 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 is the community partner that is being considered is it going to meet their goals? their personal goals. So we need to bring them into play. What are the partner goals? What are their resources? And what are their needs? So we also need to know what it is that our community partners are interested in accomplishing as well. It's not just about us. It's about them as well. We need to create, again, that win-win situation. If only one of the two uh, partner, or I'm sorry, if only one of the two entities are going to benefit from this. This is not a relationship that's going to last. Let the partner know what type of service that you want your students to provide. So when they go over to the community partner, we should you should have uh, a clear goal for the partner so that they know exactly what it is that you're interested in having them learn while they're at the partner while they're at the community partner. Uh, the academic calendar. So before you get a student started into a part into a community partnership, make sure that they are aware what the academic calendar is, so that they do know that the students may be gone for three to four weeks during the holidays. That they do know that they're going to be gone during Easter. Will that still work? Will that still suffice for that community partner? We don't want to find out a week or two before they're going on vacation, that the community partner had the greatest need for them at that point in time. So discuss these things up front. And then lastly, your students availability and compatibility with the partner hours. So we need to also make sure that the student is going to be able to accommodate the hours that the community partner would like them to work. You know, some of them are, they're going to school, they're probably working, and then on top of that, also going to a uh, community partnership. There's a lot of things that they're juggling. So we need to make sure that their availability is going to work with the partnership and with the community partner hours. Okay. Next slide, please. Capabilities and limitations of your student. So again, it's, it's, it's coming back and not the student. Make sure that they're capable of going into this partnership to work with the community partner. Do they have any limitations that we need to be aware of uh, to determine if this is still going to be a good fit? How will student orientation be conducted? I think that may have been discussed earlier and how supervision will be handled. But we wanna make sure that these students do have some sort of orientation. We don't wanna just throw them into the, uh, community service and not have understanding of what they're going to be doing, where they're going, how they're supposed to be conducting their business. So it's very important that we as the institution ensure that they're going to have some orientation, whether it's conducted by the, by the educational institution or, or if it's going to be conducted by the community service partner. And again, that should be part of the contract that you um, address. How will supervision be handled? As Michelle said earlier, well, you want to make sure that there is some supervision certainly going on. And when those individuals meet one-on-one -on -one with the supervisor that they're meeting with, we want to make sure that that's also being addressed accordingly and properly so that they're not alone. 
And then lastly, how will problems be handled? Not all placements work out. We just know this. So you need to be prepared to be able to handle those problems. And again, this is an area that should also be articulated within the contracts themselves. If you have all these contract terms and conditions established up front, when those problems arise, and hopefully they don't, but from time to time they will, you'll have a roadmap to be able to address those uh, appropriately. Uh, next slide, Amy. So ultimately what we're trying to do, as I said before, is create those win-win situations. I know when I worked with Maricel a few years ago, we, we talked a lot almost every day sometimes, particularly when she had an initiative that she was working on. And through that relationship, we were able to generate desired outcomes and clear up the roles and make sure that we understood the expectations of both parties so that we will ultimately create that win-win situation. And we also memorialized all these areas up front in the form of a contract. So it is very relational, and it's a very interesting aspect for me to work on at the university. It's very challenging from time to time, but it's also very rewarding. So I commend you, though, those of you who are participating in this type of work at your institutions, that you are really making a big difference for our students and what you're doing. And I see it all the time with our students at, at Laverne, that all the work that we put into into this up front by memorializing our contracts pays out it pays off in the end by creating those win-win situations and we have partners that we have been with for many many years so we don't have very much um, turnaround as it pertains to our partners because we are able to create those win-win situations as a team and the other team that team member that really hasn't been mentioned too much is general counsel so between civic and community engagement, risk management, and general counsel. That's a pretty pretty solid team to work with, and, and those win-win situations uh, will be frequent occurrences. Uh, that's it for me. I'll turn it back over to Marcel. Thanks, Alex, and thanks, everyone. There's some really great questions in the chat. I want to um, be able to get to a couple of those before we get go into our breakout session. But I want to just um, ask really quickly, so as you're thinking about your campuses for this coming fall with COVID, what are some of the specific maybe restrictions that are coming about um, if you're going to be in person or online? So ha has your institution decided whether or not in-person placements are going to be um, available and how have you communicated that to your community partners? Michelle, did you want to? Um, Pam, to part of my knowledge, we have not yet made a decision whether we will be doing it in person um, placements right. at this point. It's too soon. Uh, the the uh, community is in no position to decide that at this point in time. We are having a series of small Zoom meetings with all of our community partners. We typically have a large community partner meeting in the, at the end of the semester and invite risk management and public safety and all the other folks on campus who who help us during the semester and help the sites uh, we we did not obviously do that this year so we have decided to have a, a continuing series of small meetings with our um, community partners to get a sense of where they might be and kind of where they are our school district is a very big partner for us and i'm not sure that they have come up out of the fog of the um, online work so far. My, my uh, educated guess is that we will not be doing general in-person placements. We may be doing some food delivery. I noticed there was a question came up about that. Um, and, and I think the comments that were made about how to be prepared for working with a partner fit cover that pretty well. But um, generally speaking, the kinds of school programming and that kind of thing that we do, I'm not convinced it will be available or if schools are in session that they'll be able to receive us. And um, so we're going to be doing a lot of planning for alternative kinds of things that students and the university could do 
that would be more beneficial on a big, big picture societal issue kind of a thing. Um, I think there's going to have to be a lot of creative creativity done this summer. Yeah. All of colleagues. Yeah. And it might also, as a field, move us away from some of the direct service charity type work into thinking about more advocacy and, and justice oriented. I, I am actually thinking very seriously about that because um, we get caught up in that concept of volunteering quite often, which is not a bad thing. But, you know, when you're a research institution or you're in an institution where you have this possibility to do bigger kinds of things, I, I really think that's where we need to try to move the field and engage our partners. They're interested in engaging right now because they don't know what they're doing either. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then before we move into the breakouts, there was a question about um, some students are maybe conducting contract tra uh, tracing this fall and spring, but probably receiving training from certified outside organizations, which include HIPAA guidelines as part of the training. Some students may use this to work towards uh, courses. Uh, so once students receive the training, does the university need to think further about liabilities? Uh, is this complicated at all by if the contract tracing is happening on campus or off campus? So if you can speak to the contract tracing, because I know there's a there's a lot of push towards um, towards that as well. And maybe also like election uh, work or like right. poll workers and those sorts of things since the um, you know, we've got a big election in November. I'd like to speak to the contact tracing um, and this comes from part of my environmental health and safety hat as well. Um, I encourage and strongly discourage the act of contact tracing outside of your public health department. So it really depends regionally and probably internationally, it's structured differently, but within California, um, each county has a Department of Public Health officer and office, of course, and that should be doing contact tracing. Now, again, in California, we have the County of Los Angeles, which is one of the biggest hotspots in the entire country right now for amount of cases um, increasing in COVID. So the, the County Public Health is overwhelmed, and so they may be saying we can't contact trace quickly can't perform this function. So I can understand why um, it would sound like a great community engagement service to just provide that service. But it has a lot of legal implications and not only the protected health information that you're working with, but because we're almost all remote, you're using personal telephones, there's all kinds of virtual security and cybersecurity risks of contacting people and using, again, your own personal identification or phones. So that would have to be worked out. People need um, training. Of course, there's free training now through Johns Hopkins and other organizations that would teach you about contact tracing. But I know for us in the California State University system, we will not be um, performing contact tracing as, as campuses. And we can um, participate and help the county when they need to know maybe contact info or something that we might be able to provide that's not um, FERPA protected, then we would do that. But we, we will not be encouraging um, any of our students or employees to actually perform contact tracing as a university function. It would only be with the, the health department and working for them. And if they're placed at the health department, then they would follow all of the guidelines and training and requirements, and legal authority under that, but not as a university. Great, thanks. And what about like being poll workers or election judges and those sorts of things? So it's the question, would we support it if, as a risk manager? Yes, I would support it. And per, so my what I try to do with Pam is, what's the initiative you want to do and how can I support it? So if the decision is to have them be poll workers, then yes, I would say work with your risk manager to put them in the safest possible position they can be in. Talk to them about PPE, talk to them about hand washing. But I do encourage you also talk to the wider your wider institution on the thought of sending your students into the community and bringing them back again when you're trying to keep an isolated community um, and stop the spread. But yeah, we would, my office would be there to support it and teach the students how to best do it. So another great resource for, it's not the traditional way of thinking of it in polit political terms, but the census, they're expert in handling. And I, and I, I would venture to say, I have not looked that they are now also prepared in light of COVID with good hygiene practices, but they are real experts at, um, as a good resource for you as a risk manager when you're like, is this even safe to send students out for these political needs? And 
in certain communities and, and neighborhoods may not be, but the Census Bureau has really good training materials and guidelines. Great, thanks. I also, Marisol, one thing I would add, if students are doing this as part of a course, mm -hmm. if, if, they're, if that's part of their coursework, then that enhances the liability for the university. So I think you have to be really clear because we have some faculty that would have their students doing this, these kinds of placements for their courses. So I think that's, that's one thing, and, I, and Michelle and, and would help me with that through the dean's offices, yeah. 